This summer, India faces a sweltering heat wave. Over a hundred people have already died from soaring temperatures and heat strokes. In Delhi and Rajasthan alone, temperatures rose to over 50% Celsius. Even coastal states like Odisha, whose beaches and historical temples draw in tourists around the year, saw spikes in temperature that left locals struggling. In June 2024, in just under 72 hours, eight people died of heat stroke in Odisha. The previous months have not been any better. In May this year, flash floods raged through the Badakhshan, Baghlan, and Takar provinces in Afghanistan, leaving thousands homeless and hundreds dead. They followed on the heels of equally disastrous flooding in April, after persistent rains fed the country's waterways for most of the month. By now, the death toll lingers around 450. Meanwhile, Bangladesh recorded its hottest month ever in April. As multiple countries struggle to adapt to climate change, it is clear that it has become a global challenge. Developing countries like Bangladesh and Afghanistan are often disproportionately affected by climate change, despite contributing less to global emissions historically. Often, they also depend entirely on economic sectors that are climate-sensitive, like agriculture, fishing, mining, or forestry, making their populations even more vulnerable to its effects. For instance, Liberia, with its lush rainforests and plains, looks nothing like the deserts with severe temperatures that spring to mind when we talk about climate change. But Liberia's dependence on climate-sensitive sectors, coupled with high levels of poverty and infrastructure that is incapable of responding to natural disasters, means that it is under a much graver threat than developed countries. In 2021, China, the United States, India, Russia, Japan, and the 27 countries of EU were the world's largest CO2 emitters. Meanwhile, the contribution of developing countries is almost negligible. EDGAR, the emissions database for global atmospheric research, found that they accounted for 49.2% of global population, 62.4% of global gross domestic product, 66.4% of global fossil fuel consumption, and 67.8% of global fossil CO2 emissions. They also exceed their allotted carbon budgets, the maximum amount of carbon dioxide they are allowed to emit to keep global temperatures under a certain threshold. Think of carbon budgets as a traditional budget. On one side, you have your expenditures, and on the other, your income. The idea is to balance the two so that you don't go into debt. If you manage to create a safety cushion with a little bit of saving, that's even better. Carbon budgets balance carbon emissions, our expenditures, against a global rise in temperatures, our income. They cap the amount of carbon countries are allowed to produce, to keep the rise in temperature below the threshold of 1.5 degrees. In February of 2024, the EU's Copernicus Climate Change Service announced that this threshold had been breached for a full 12 months for the first time. This satellite footage from NASA shows just how bad things have become. Average global temperatures have risen over time to alarming levels, and most of the developing countries affected harshly by it are not responsible for this mess. They still have a carbon budget surplus, but their populations must contend with floods, droughts, and famines brought on by the effects of this global rise in temperature. This dilemma led to the idea of climate finance. In 1992, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, known more informally as the Earth Summit, was held in Rio de Janeiro. It recognized that developed nations had a greater responsibility towards mitigating the effects of climate change and established a financial mechanism that would lay the groundwork for economic support for developing countries. Another turning point occurred at the COP15 climate summit held in 2009 when world leaders pledged to mobilize $100 billion every year in climate financing to support climate action in developing countries by the year 2020. All of these countries are obligated to contribute towards this fund. And so, climate financing finally began in earnest. During the period from 2015 to 2020, India received a whopping $5.1 billion in aid. Egypt received $2.9 billion, of which $2.1 is designated as a loan that it must repay. And Kenya received $3.4 billion, with $1.9 allotted as a loan. 
Other countries had even worse grant-to-loan ratios. Sri Lanka must pay back 1.5 billion of the 1.6 it received. Tunisia must return 1.5 billion out of the 1.8 it received. And Iraq must return 1.1 billion out of 1.4. These loans come with a steep price, interest. When poor or middle-income countries receive climate assistance in the form of loans, the richer countries doling out these loans stand to make an income. The aid they provide is no longer born out of altruism, and while some argue that interest rates help them to hedge against risks, they can become burdensome for the countries struggling to stay afloat. At the heart of climate finance lies the recognition that pollution in one country can cause a pandemic in another, that rising temperatures in one part of the ocean can affect food supply chains in another, and that unequal socio-economic structures can permeate neighboring regions and lead to chaos at a global level. Between 2015 and 2020, approximately $353 billion was reportedly allocated for climate finance, with $189 billion directed to poorer nations. But over half of this direct bilateral funding consisted of loans with interest. A Reuters investigation found that wealthy countries have loaned at least $18 billion for climate finance at market rate interest. Some came with strings attached, donor countries asked that recipient nations hire companies in the donor nations or purchase materials from them, ensuring that the money they lent benefited them directly. Meanwhile, critics continue to insist that climate finance must come free of cost, in the form of interest-free loans, or grants that do not have to be repaid. But as efforts to make these programs financially viable for developing countries ramp up, so do the stakes. In recent years, climate-related disasters have been far worse than before. In 2022, torrential floods swept through Pakistan. They were caused by a mix of heavy rains and glacial lake outburst floods. As temperatures skyrocketed, the ice dams that naturally form around lakes fed by glacier melted and burst, and water swept through Pakistan's rivers in the north at breakneck speed. Hundreds of acres of farmland were rendered useless, roads were swamped, people were cut off from emergency services, and livestock killed. In the end, 1,739 people died. Hundreds of thousands became homeless. Conservative estimates placed the damage from the floods at 14.9 billion US dollars. But Pakistan's heavy reliance on agriculture also meant that the country's income was severely impacted. And as flood waters lingered instead of draining out, they caused long-term changes to its soil quality, changing the country's income potential for the foreseeable future. The amount of aid Pakistan received in return is dwarfed by this number, and the country is still struggling to recover. The Global South continues to demand that climate aid be given in the form of grants, not loans, but the Global North remains steadfast in its resistance. The rift between developed and developing nations widens daily. As the global movement grows louder, the poorest countries demand support and ask for promises to be kept, before it's too late. For more on climate finance and global geopolitics, subscribe to DRM News International.